super strength and durability, super speed and reflexes, wall crawling abilities, web slinging, the spider sense, and a catalog of witty one-liners. It's easy to understand why Spider-Man is so popular. The Webbed Wonder is by far Marvel's most recognizable superhero, and only Batman and Superman from DC can claim to be as iconic as him. So it should come as no surprise that he's appeared in well over a dozen movies on the big screen over the years. And the future's looking bright for him in the Marvel Cinematic Universe as well. In this documentary, we'll be looking into the history of Spider-Man in film. When you think of Spider-Man movies, you probably think no further back than the early 2000s, when Tobey Maguire played the character in Sam Raimi's iconic trilogy. But we actually begin our journey through the Webbed Wonders feature film history 25 years before Maguire donned the iconic red and blue suit. 1977's Spider-Man served as the pilot for the 1978 television series The Amazing Spider-Man. And while it was made for television, it did receive a limited theatrical release abroad having been distributed by Columbia Pictures. It came at an exciting time for comic book fans, as Wonder Woman had been on television for two years, with Linda Carter in the lead role, and Superman would hit the big screen a year later, with Christopher Reeve playing the Man of Steel. Spider-Man was making his big screen debut at the perfect moment. The movie starred Nicholas Hammond, who is perhaps most famous for playing Frederick Von Trapp in 1965's The Sound of Music in the titular role, and it was fairly well received. Hammond really wasn't bad as Spidey. It was an origin story that saw Peter Parker bitten by a radioactive spider, as is usually the case. And he subsequently came up against Edward Byron, a mysterious guru who placed New Yorkers under mind control to rob banks for him. When he threatened to force his victims to kill themselves, Spider-Man was forced to intervene. But things took a turn for the worse when the webbed wonder ended up falling victim to Byron's powers. It earned $9 million at the box office, which wasn't bad considering its limited release, and was the highest highest performing CBS production of the year. Nicholas Hammond reprised his role as the titular superhero, but this time he went up against international villain Mr. White and his monstrous henchman Angel. White's plan in the movie was to obtain plutonium and blow up, amongst other things, the World Trade Center and an area of Los Angeles in which the United States president was giving a speech. If he wasn't given one million dollars, that is. It wasn't as critically well received as the first movie, and the criticism was mainly aimed at the movie's low budget and a lack of impressive special effects. That didn't stop another movie from being released as a spin-off from the television series, however. But before that happened, there was another Spider-Man movie in 1978, simply called Spider-Man. Like the aforementioned movies, it was also directly related to a television show. But in this one's case, it was a spin-off from the Japanese version. It starred Shinji Todo as Spider-Man, whose real name in this reality was Takuya Yamashiro, and saw the webbed wonder going up against the Iron Cross Army and the Sea Devil, the group's semi-mechanical anthropomorphic swordfish with the ability to shoot torpedoes from its mouth. Moreover, Spidey had to transform into a giant mecha to fight the monster. It was crazy stuff. It was Far from great, but its high levels of absurdity meant it was quite entertaining to watch. In 1981, the third movie starring Nicholas Hammond was released, Spider-Man The Dragon's Challenge. Like the other Hammond-led Spidey movies, it was only released theatrically abroad. It was a composite of the 1979 two-part TV episode The Chinese Web, and it notably featured Ted Danson in one of his earliest roles as an actor. It saw Spidey head to Hong Kong, where he attempted to flush out a couple of bad guys whose intention it was to kill Min Lo Chan, a very rich but very nice Chinese industrialist who the hero vowed to protect. While there's nowhere near enough to keep kids entertained, The Dragon's Challenge isn't half bad as a movie for adults in terms of suspense and story, even today. But it was the last time Hammond would play the webbed wonder in a theatrically released production. For the rest of the 1980s and the entirety of the 1990s, Spider-Man would be absent from the world of live-action movies. In the 80s, this was thanks largely to the poor box box office performance of movies like 1983's Superman 3, which made movie adaptations of comic book properties a very low priority. There was, however, still a lot of talk about more Spider-Man movies being developed. 
Canon Films agreed to pay Marvel $225,000 for the rights to Spider-Man, in addition to a percentage of the revenue, should they make any movies based on the character, with the condition being that if no movies were made by 1990, Marvel would regain the rights to him. The likes of Toby Hooper, of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre fame, were touted to direct, but Hooper was under the impression that Spider-Man was a similar concept to the Wolfman, and envisioned a movie as a horror offering. Throughout the 1990s, the idea of another Spider-Man movie kept rearing its head. The likes of Kuroko Films and MGM were linked with purchasing the rights to the character, and James Cameron was tempted by the idea of directing. He even wrote a screenplay for it, which he pitched to Kuroko, but with 20th Century Fox claiming exclusivity on his services as a director, and thus ownership of the script, the whole situation became very convoluted. Cameron would have brought Arnold Schwarzenegger on board as Dr. Octopus, and given how Arnie's portrayal of Mr. Freeze went in 1997's Batman and Robin, it's safe to say we're glad that never happened. In 1996, Marvel went bankrupt, but they emerged from said bankruptcy two years later in 1998, and the new incarnation of the company licensed Spider-Man rights to Columbia Pictures, which was by then a subsidiary of Sony Pictures Entertainment. In the year 2000, another Spider-Man movie was finally confirmed to be in development, and after a number of directors had been shortlisted, including Roland Emmerich, Tony Scott, Chris Columbus, Ang Lee, Jan DeBont, and David Fincher, Sam Raimi was confirmed as being the man at the movie's helm. It would be released in 2002. Raimi seemed like an odd choice to some people, as he was most famous for creating the cult horror series The Evil Dead. And although he did have some superhero movie experience, 1990's Darkman was very different in tone and content to anything involving Spider-Man. While Blade and the X-Men had come before it in 1998 and 2000, respectively, Spider-Man was the first truly big comic book name to get the movie treatment since Batman five years earlier, and it would be the first Spider-Man offering with a genuinely huge budget of $139 million, meaning fans would get to see a realistic depiction of the webbed wonder, swinging around New York for the first time. The likes of Leonardo DiCaprio, Edward Furlong, Freddie Prince Jr., Chris Klein, Wes Bentley, Heath Ledger, Scott Speedman, Jay Roden, and James Frank were considered for the role of Spider-Man, but Tobey Maguire was ultimately cast, having been Raimi's first choice since being impressed by his performance in 1999's The Cider House Rules. It would also be the first time a major Spider-Man villain had been depicted in a live-action Spider-Man movie, as Willem Dafoe would play Norman Osborn, whose firing from his own company caused him to go mad and use some of his own technology to become the Green Goblin. The movie depicted Spidey's origins again, with Peter Parker being bitten by a genetically modified spider, then using his newly acquired abilities to fight evil after the tragedy of his Uncle Ben being killed by a petty criminal. The emergence of another superpowered character in the form of the aforementioned Green Goblin cemented Spidey as a superhero in this universe, and with acting support from the likes of James Franco, as well as J.K. Simmons, Kirsten Dunst, and Rosemary Harris, Marvel had a franchise on their hands. Maguire played a great nerdy Peter Parker and a decent Spider-Man. The movie earned a $821.7 million at the global box office, and was praised universally by critics. 2 years later in 2004, Raimi and Maguire were back with Spider-Man 2. The majority of the supporting cast also returned, and they were notably joined by Alfred Molina, who played nuclear scientist Otto Octavius, aka Dr. Octopus. The movie saw Maguire's Parker being mentored by Molina's Octavius, before a sentient set of robotic tentacles merged with the latter and turned him into a supervillain. Molina's performance as Doc Ock was one of the main reasons Spider-Man 2 is still considered one of the very best superheroes movies ever made. It was a better movie than its predecessor, which is really saying something, and was critically acclaimed en masse. Maguire's performance in the lead role was more emotional than the first outing, and he was also rightly showered with praise. The movie earned $783.8 million at the box office, which was less than the first one, but still made it a huge commercial success. Then came Spider-Man 3. 
the 2007 sequel, and the final offering in what is now known as Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy, saw a dramatic and almost inexplicable decrease in quality for the franchise. The main problem was the fact that there were too many villains, with Topher Grace's Venom, Thomas Hayden Church's Sandman, and James Franco's New Goblin being one bad guy too many. Moreover, even taking the best parts of all three of them, they didn't come close to being as good as Alfred Molina's Dr. Octopus. For the most part, Maguire's performance was, again, very good, but the scenes in which the Venom symbiote took hold of him were highly criticized. He became an emo Spider-Man with a penchant for dancing, and it just didn't work. The movie received mixed reviews that were generally leaning towards the negative side, and in hindsight, it's even worse than we remember, which makes the fact that it grossed $890.9 million at the global box office all the more bizarre. It was the most commercially successful of the three movies in the trilogy, and it remains the highest grossing Spider-Man solo movie to this day, but its comparatively poor quality meant no more movies were made in the franchise. That being said, for several years after Spider-Man 3, rumors of sequels and spin-offs persisted. Spider-Man 4 had entered development in 2007, and Raimi, Maguire, and the supporting cast were initially all on board again. In fact, the idea of shooting two sequels concurrently was touted, with a villain set to be Dylan Baker playing the Lizard and John Malkovich playing the Vulture, which would undoubtedly have been very cool. A Venom spin-off was also planned, with the character set to be depicted as an anti-hero rather than a supervillain. The movies didn't ultimately happen, however, largely due to the fact that Raimi read several potential scripts and hated them all, which resulted in him leaving the franchise, and that was that. Meanwhile, following Raimi's exit from the Maguire-led Spider-Man trilogy, a cinematic reboot was announced in 2010, and in 2012, The Amazing Spider-Man was released. British actor Andrew Garfield was cast in the lead role, having vied with the likes of Jamie Bell, Alden Ehrenreich, Frank Delane, Josh Hutcherson, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Anton Yelchin, Logan Lerman, and Michael Angarano to land it. It would be yet another origin story, directed by Mark Webb, and fans were incredibly excited for this intriguing reboot. The supporting cast was impressive and included the likes of Emma Stone, Sally Field, Martin Sheen, and Reese Evans, who would be playing the movie's villain, Dr. Kurt Connors a genetic scientist and amputee whose regenerative serum would transform him into the hideous lizard, prompting Spider-Man into action. It received generally favorable reviews and grossed a fairly impressive $757.9 million from a budget estimated to be around $230 million. Garfield was, for the most part, praised for his performance, especially as Spider-Man. His physique gave him the right look for the character, and his wittiness was perfect for delivering Spider-Man's one-liners, though some people felt he was was too cool to be playing the supposedly nerdy Peter Parker. Nonetheless, a sequel was greenlit, and The Amazing Spider-Man 2 was released in 2014, but not before Spider-Man made a surprising appearance in another movie. Although it didn't receive a cinematic release, 2013's Phineas and Ferb Mission Marvel was a crossover television movie of the animated series Phineas and Ferb that also featured characters from the Marvel Universe. It saw Drake Bell reprising his role from Ultimate Spider-Man and Avengers Assemble as Peter Parker, with the plot being that Dr. Doofenshmirtz's latest invention caused Marvel superheroes to lose their powers, prompting them to team up with Phineas and Ferb to save the world from both Doofenshmirtz and Marvel's villains. The movie had 3.8 million viewers, which was Phineas and Ferb's series' highest ratings in six months. It was the number one TV telecast across major youth demos on its night of airing, and was the number one cable television telecast in terms of total viewers. It aired in the United Kingdom a month after its U.S. release and garnered an audience of 234,000, taking its total to more than 4 million in those two countries alone. Critically, the movie was widely praised for being extremely funny, with reviewers saying that instead of worrying about it kidifying Marvel's characters, viewers should just enjoy the magic of Phineas and Ferb. And we have to agree. In 2014, we returned to the Amazing Spider-Man franchise with The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Mark Webb returned to direct, and Andrew Garfield returned to star along with the majority of the first movie supporting cast. But it would be the last time the British actor played the webbed wonder. Although the movie was originally envisioned as the beginning of a shared universe, which would have continued with two sequels and a number of spin-offs focusing on Venom and the Sinister Six, it simply wasn't successful enough in terms of the critical response or the money it brought in. It saw Jamie 
Fox as Electro, Dane DeHaan as the Green Goblin, Paul Giamatti as Rhino, and Chris Cooper in a minor role as Norman Osborn. In a nutshell, it made the same mistakes as Spider-Man 3 by having too many villains. But that wasn't all that was wrong with it. It had an unfocused narrative, and was overstuffed with plot lines and set pieces. Which was a shame, because Garfield was great, as were Stone, Fox, DeHaan, and the movie's special effects. It made $709 million at the global box office, from a budget estimated to be up to $293 million, and that wasn't deemed good enough to continue the franchise. While that was a bit of a shame, not least because of the way the movie ended, which had some fans' mouths watering wanting to see Spidey fighting Rhino and the Sinister Six forming, it definitely worked out for the best, as we were finally going to see Spider-Man, who is of course Marvel's flagship character, in Marvel's flagship movie franchise. In December of 2014, Sony Pictures' computers were hacked, which resulted in the public reveal that Sony and Marvel Studios had been discussing the possibility of allowing Spider-Man to appear in Marvel Cinematic Universe. And on February the 9th, 2015, Sony Pictures and Marvel Studios announced that would indeed be the case, with Spidey making his MCU debut in 2016's Captain America Civil War. The deal between the two studios meant Marvel Studios could use Spider-Man in the MCU indefinitely going forward, but Sony would still still maintain distribution rights and creative control over the character and his supporting cast. And we'll come back to that later. Casting for the role was soon underway, and by the end of May in 2015, Asa Butterfield, Tom Holland, Judah Lewis, Matthew Lintz, Charlie Plummer, and Charlie Rowe had all screen tested for it, opposite Robert Downey Jr., who of course portrays Tony Stark in the MCU, for chemistry. In June, Marvel Studios bigwigs Kevin Feige and Amy Pascal had narrowed the actors considered down to Holland and Rowe, who both screen tested with Downey Jr. again, with Holland also testing with Chris Evans, who portrays Steve Rogers in the franchise. By the end of June, Sony Pictures and Marvel Studios had jointly announced that Holland would play Spider-Man, making him the second British actor to do so in the 2010s. In March of 2016, fans got their first glimpse of Holland's Spidey in the second Civil War trailer, as a simple, hey everyone, sent them crazy in their millions. And he made his official debut in the franchise two months later when the movie was released. Directed by Anthony and Joe Russo, it saw the introduction of the Sokovia Accords in the MCU, which required the Avengers to operate under government jurisdiction after their previous fights had resulted in a lot of environmental damage and the loss of lives, which split the franchise's heroes into two factions, Tony Stark's pro-Accords team and Steve Rogers' anti-Accords team. Spidey's role in the movie was that, in order to go up against Rogers' rogue group, Tony Stark recruited him to assist, and we got to see him both as Peter Parker and Spider. Man, the latter of which was in the movie's epic set-piece battle at Stuttgart Airport in Germany. He proved himself to be a formidable opponent, even implementing a tactic that disabled Scott Lang in his giant-sized form. Oh, and for a nice change, Marvel Studios decided to skip Spider-Man's origin story. The movie was a monster success, both critically and commercially, and Holland was universally praised for his portrayal of both Peter Parker and Spider-Man. He was the right build, had genuine agility, portrayed the nerdy side of Parker brilliantly, as well as the talkative nature of Spider-Man. From a budget of $250 million, Captain America Civil War grossed a whopping $1.153 billion worldwide, and was praised in particular for both its actions and its mature, thought-provoking themes. A year later, in 2017, Spider-Man got his first solo movie as a member of Marvel's flagship movie franchise, and it came in the form of the aptly named Spider-Man Homecoming. Directed by John Watts, Homecoming saw Tom Holland's version of the character going up against Michael Keaton's Adrian Toomes, a man who used salvaged Chitauri technology to create advanced weaponry and sell it on the black market, and unfortunately for Peter Parker, was his Homecoming date's father. Toomes would use equipment of his own creation to become the villainous Vulture, who was enough of a handful for Spidey to contend with on his own, without the aid of the MCU's version of Shocker lending a hand in a minor role. It was the best Spider-Man solo movie since 2004 Spider-Man 2, and in some people's eyes, the best Spider-Man movie ever, period. Holland was, again, 
fantastic. And the able mentoring of Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark did the movie no harm either. It had a light tone, focused very much on Peter Parker's human side, and was distinctive enough from other Spider-Man movies to make it feel fresh, while also fitting snugly into the MCU without having to focus too much on franchise building. It had a budget of $175 million, and grossed $880.2 million worldwide, just $10 million less than Spider-Man 3. Then, in 2018, came Avengers Infinity War, the biggest movie Spider-Man has ever appeared in. The third Avengers movie signaled the return of the Russo brothers to the MCU director's chair, and saw the mad titan Thanos acting on his wish to wipe out half of all life in the universe, by collecting all six of the powerful Infinity Stones, and doing it with a mere snap of his fingers. Tom Holland's Spider-Man found himself in the thick of the action early on in the movie, as he joined Iron Man, Doctor Strange, and Wong in fighting Thanos' minions, before inadvertently heading to Thanos' home planet of Titan, and doing battle with the pruned chin villain himself. Of course, Spidey would actually become one of the victims of Thanos' snap, which is now officially referred to as the Decimation, and as of this moment, he no longer exists in the franchise. But given that he's set to appear in the sequel, we're pretty sure that's not a permanent thing. Avengers Infinity War cost around $400 million to make, and is by far and away the highest grossing movie Spider-Man has ever appeared in, having brought in $2.048 billion at the global box office. It was epic, and was extremely well received critically, with Holland's performance one of the many highlights, and his emotional final scenes were some of the most heartbreaking in comic book movie history. 2018 also saw something unprecedented happen in the world of Spider-Man. A Venom movie was released without him in it. We referred earlier to the fact that Sony Pictures retained the distribution rights and creative control of Spider-Man and his supporting characters, and the studio has decided to create a new franchise with Spider-Man's supporting characters. Venom's origin is tied to Spider-Man's in the comic books, but the character's self-titled movie, which was directed by Ruben Fleischer and starred Tom Hardy in the titular role, scrapped that idea and simply had Hardy's Eddie Brock gain Venom's powers via an alien symbiote without Spider-Man's influence. Although it's grossed more than $850 million at the global box office to date, the critical response has been, well, pretty much what you'd expect from a Venom movie without Spider-Man in it. Terrible. 2018 was a busy year for the webbed wonder, as the end of the year also saw the release of a very different kind of Spider-Man movie, in the form of Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Into the Spider-Verse is a computer animated movie with a budget of $90 million, with Shameik Moore in the lead role as Miles Morales. But the movie's very concept means there's more than one version of Spider-Man in it, as Morales is introduced to the Spider-Verse, where he meets countless other spider people, and indeed spider animals like Spider-Ham. Critically, it's absolutely smashing it. People are loving it. The franchise is said to be adjunct to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. As we've already touched upon, 2019 will be a big year for Spider-Man, with the release of Avengers Endgame, in which the iconic superhero will undoubtedly be brought back to life in the MCU, and Spider-Man Far From Home, in which Tom Holland's character will be going up against Mysterio in a live-action movie for the first time, with a Master of Illusion being played by Academy Award nominee Jake Gyllenhaal. Beyond that, who knows exactly what the future holds for Spider-Man in the world of movies, but he's had a huge impact on that world already, and he's sure to be a big player in the MCU for years to come, and we're totally here for it. Are you a fan of Spider-Man? Would you like to see even more of him on the big screen? What's your favorite Spider-Man movie? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to Screen Rant for more great videos just like this one. See you guys next time.